So um, thank you very much um, to Nigel and Ian and David for organising these. They've been really useful to quite a number of people. Um, I just want to introduce myself and Danny. So my name's Ian Bailey. I'm a teaching fellow in biochemical sciences at the University of Surrey. And Danny is my long-suffering um, PhD student whose pedagogical project looks specifically at developing biochemical literacy and how we might deliver biochemical literacy more, more effectively. Um, which leads then to the work we see here where we ask, can wet lab teaching be enhanced by virtual lab software? So um, this work will link very heavily into Danny's PhD and we'll kind of talk about that as we go through um, and give you some context. So we're going to start with the context um, and this flowchart diagram really shows the kind of plan for Danny's thesis. So biochemical literacy it kind of links back to the concept of subject literacy. And subject literacies are something that have developed over the last 10 to 15 years and there are really solid examples in higher education of chemical literacy and psychological literacy where you're really asking the question what does a student need to be able to do to be a whatever the subject is. So in this case you know what is a biochemist, what is it that a biochemist does and what does a biochemist need to be able to do to be a biochemist and what does a biochemist need to know. So as part of that project Danny's constructed a biochemical literacy framework so I'm going to do a quick shout out because we're resubmitting a paper um, following review uh, next week um, where we hope to publish that biochemical literacy framework um, and it, as part of that Danny's identified um, a number of capabilities which have been um, clustered in hierarchy which link back to what we expect a biochemical a, a graduate biochemist to be able to do and as part of this kind of overarching biochemical literacy theme we've been asking how can we facilitate the development of biochemical literacy in all students because biochemistry is one of those sciences that underpins all of the biosciences um, as well as being a, an overt topic of its own so part of that has been um, the signature pedagogies um, and the signature pedagogies are what are unique features of teaching biochemistry um, and I guess you know one of the big questions in that particular area is are there signature pedagogies that are exclusive to biochemistry because it might turn out that actually it's a bioscience specific rather than biochemistry specific approach. And then we've got the question of, of how we facilitate laboratory skills and the development of laboratory skills most effectively. And we wanted to know or to look to see if virtual lab software could assist the students in developing those practical skills. And it's from this area that we thought you guys might be most interested today um, going through. So to kind of give you a, a short um, impression of what biochemical literacy is and the biochemical literacy framework, it breaks down into these six areas. So the first area is critical thinking. And critical thinking means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And almost everyone you talk to, just like every true good quality academic concept, has so many different opinions and thought processes. But the idea of critical thinking boils down to the ability to question information and the ability to uh, apply uh, those questions to any range of information, but also um, to solve problems and to think um, about applying practical solutions or techniques to new areas and how we might adapt those. Then we have information literacy, which ranges from the kind of information you would get from a Google search, all the way through to the ability to extract information from data tables and graphs. And more importantly, it's about selecting the correct information. And the information that is most applicable or most appropriate um, for answering whatever question is being asked. Then we have self-management, which sounds a bit strange, but self-management is, is a range of different things. But one of the major key things is being receptive to feedback and having a good feedback literacy. So, you know, the, the scientific process is one of continuous critique. And as scientists, we're supposed to be 
um, not precious about our data and encouraging people to question and critique that data. And a big part of that is being receptive, open, and able to understand the feedback we receive. As part of that, then, is communication, being able to talk to each other, being able to communicate data in the form of graphs, tables, papers, so everything from peer-reviewed literature through to um, an oral communication like this. Um, then we have visual literacy, which is a range of different things, but it, it might be the ability to interpret different graphical representations of data. But for a biochemist in particular, there's a three-dimensional element to um, visual literacy, and that is uh, in, in imagining or envisioning the shape of a molecule. So if you imagine that you might have a complex protein structure like a, a, a an enzyme or a nuclear receptor, being able to imagine and explain and think about that as a three-dimensional construct that you can then apply an understanding to is a big part of being a biochemist. And then finally, uh, last but not least, are the practical skills. And because biochemistry is one of those sciences that underpins so many different sciences, we have um, a number of practical skills which might be from the really hardcore proteomics through to gene cloning and manipulation, which are all branches of biochemistry. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Danny. Uh, so the project around wet lab teaching and uh, the enhancement of it through virtual laboratory software, one of the things we really wanted to look at was student self-efficacy in the lab around uh, preparing for practical work, uh, the health and safety in the laboratory, using the laboratory protocol and instructions, the equipment, um, and asking questions about theory behind the practical, and then the their sort of future work as it were, so the data manipulation um, and using what they got in the laboratory. Um, and what we wanted to do was compare this self-efficacy um, when using the virtual lab software in their modules with those modules where they didn't have it. So it's still within the university, it's still broadly the same teaching teams, but still just comparing their experiences with it and without the software. Uh, and we did this across three time points in the year. Uh, one of our other aims of this was... Apologies, Ian. Oh, there we go. Never mind, it advanced. Um, the was to look around the the contextual kind of uh, element of this. So looking at focus groups with our students to be able to look alongside our semi quantitative measures of, of impact around this self efficacy. Um, and we did this using a guided self focus a uh, guided focus group format um, to look at the student opinion to discuss why they found uh, this software useful or not and um, where they would like to see more of it or less of it and how, what we mean, how they used it. Uh, so the virtual laboratory software that we used was that of learning science and how we implemented this was as uh, pre-laboratory uh, experiences which the students had free access to um, and then some post-laboratory uh, worksheets. Now, initially we used these as both formative and summative, and then in, in subsequent years, we've just used this formatively. So the timeline of per academic year of this data collection were uh, three points. So the beginning of the year, this is before the students had had lots of lab experience. They might have had an induction, but that was about it. Um, and that was their real, we were really trying to capture their feelings around coming into university here and how they used it at the very start. We then had a mid-year survey, which was just at the end of the semester one teaching, but before they'd had their exams, um, in order to capture how they'd used it across the whole of that first semester. And then finally, we did an end of academic year to see how they'd used it throughout the full academic year and into that second semester, where they're more familiar with university um, and we wondered whether that might make an impact on how it was used. Um, so we looked at all our biochemistry modules specifically here, which use the software. Um, and there were four modules in total, two in each semester. And this um, was split. So the one of the modules in each semester was our 
sort of more traditional biosciences, so the biochemist, biomedical, biological, uh, and the other module is our sort of nutritional focused sciences, so nutrition, food science, dietetics. Um, and the practicals they did were very much, were very similar, it was sort of how they were, what they were maybe focusing on was slightly different. So first I'm going to discuss the effects that we found on the student self-efficacy um, of using the lab software. Uh, in terms of demographics, um, our respondents, we had 179 unique responses across all three, uh, with a total of 449 responses at all. We estimate that to be about a 40% response rate. Um, we had a good... Uh, amount of students from each of the programs uh, engaging with this. So the program uh, percentages of, of, of um, participants were about representative of what we have uh, at Surrey. Um, so biomedical sciences being our largest cohort with biological biochemistry being about the same and less on our nutrition. Uh, in terms of gender, wasn't entirely representative, but very close. So here we're going to talk around, this is the self-efficacy data. So self-efficacy we took on a Likert scale from one to five, with one being uh, they felt much less uh, confident using the virtual lab software uh, than if in the modules where they didn't have it, and five being they were much more confident having virtual lab software than in modules where they didn't. Uh, three was a similar confidence. Um, so to do this, we did a one sample t-test uh, against the test value of three, the similar confidence, um, in order to determine the sort of statistical significance of these, of these changes. Um, so if we look at laboratory preparation first, which is to the left of our graph, uh, we noticed that there was quite a, there was a statistical significance at all three time points, with blue being the year beginning, red being our year midpoint, and yellow being our end of year. And all three time points, students felt significantly more confident in modules where they did have our virtual lab software than in modules where they didn't. This trend continues across all six, including health and safety, using the protocol, using the equipment, the theory questions, and then their future work. Uh, again, all three time points in all, all three uh, areas. Um, and if we move to the next slide, we can see that the greatest difference, as I'm sure you guessed from the previous slide, was in fact in the equipment, which is where we would think that that's a particularly, particularly good area for, our, for the lab software to target is this self-efficacy in equipment because it gives the students a chance to use it and then use it again in the lab, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about more. Um, and the although still significant, the smallest mean difference was it was in the theory area. Um, so students, although they felt more significantly more confident in asking questions around the theory, it wasn't as much of a change as in equipment and preparation and so on. So I'll talk around the focus group data, which personally is my favorite bit of data because I found it particularly insightful. So first thing we talked about was the overall laboratory experiences of the students, how they felt uh, using the software versus not. And um, this particular quote captures that quite well. So they felt that using the software gave them a better idea of what to expect coming to the labs and made them feel more prepared for the biochemistry ones rather than the modules where they didn't have the support. Um, and that rings true around a lot of the data that we collected from the focus groups is this feeling of more prepared, just an idea of what to expect. Um, and so we dug down a little bit into why they felt this was the case. Um, and so uh, some of the reasons include the fact that the fact that they had taken a gap year, so there was a large time difference uh, since they'd, they'd previously been in the lab. And knowing the fact that the equipment is different at the university, more expensive, um, more complex, they were very worried, very nerve wracking, which is what our previous slide was. These were the words they used to describe how they felt coming into their first one. They're very, very emotive, they're very negative, they're very, lots of stress, there's lots of pressure, lots of, you know, they were sometimes scared even coming into our labs. Um, and it, it seemed to be really focusing around this use of new equipment in the, this, um, this, new environment um, but they felt that the software really helped because it allowed them that the safe place as it were to get used to it to 
sort of have a moment to, to see what differences there might be between perhaps an A-level laboratory and the laboratories that we have at Surrey. Um, and part of the reason that they felt that it might help was this, this built-in formative feedback um, element. So I felt this, uh, this particular quote quite captures that. It's like, I liked that it gave the answer. It gave you feedback immediately and told you if it was right. I also thought it was really helpful that it would tell you the right answer eventually. It did make me feel more confident in what I was doing and that I was doing it right. Also, if I was going wrong, then I could see, oh, that's not right. How did I go wrong? Or how do I get the right answer from that? You can really see with this, the student is, is going into that self-reflective element. They're like, okay, well, I got this wrong, but why have I got this wrong? Um, and we found that in the labs, the students would often refer back to what they'd done in the virtual lab experiences for those who, who'd, who'd taken the opportunity to use them. They were really able to engage in that and use that to, to boost their self-confidence around using their new equipment. So uh, I'll pass back over to Ian to talk a little bit about the takeaway messages from this. So um, that's quite a lot of information to have received in a short space of time. Um, and I'm sure you'll have some questions about that. But one of the things we wanted to do is distill this into some kind of pragmatic and practical things to take away. Because moving into next year, I know many of us are thinking about how we can employ virtual activities to help support um, lab time, especially given that uh, social distancing means that many of our labs are at a third or half the capacity at maximum. So, um, you know, there are a few kind of main points that I want to take away. Uh, one of them is that, you know, when you're using a virtual um, system, it has to be embedded in the virtual learning environment. So whatever virtual learning environment system that you use in your institution, you really have to embed it. You know, students don't or won't um, engage in much kind of searching activity. The more they have to do to access something, the less accessible it becomes. Um, and they're not really willing to put a huge amount of effort in. So either if it's a part of the VLE, or whether it's a simple click link away from the VLE, in which case they will happily follow that. But the more barriers there are, um, and if they have to log in, etc., then it becomes much harder to get them to engage with it. And that's borne out by a number of other studies as well. Um, now, uh, we, we also noticed that the students um, wanted guidance. So, you know, we all think that students these days are hugely technologically literate and that they have, you know, smartphones at their fingertips and it's all brilliant and they'll all access it really nicely. But actually, you know, most of us already know from being on the ground that they're terrified and that they won't access it unless they know how it works. So. One of the things I did, and that I know the students found useful based on their feedback, was that we took them through those virtual learning activities. We showed them how to access them. We showed them what was involved. We talked to them about the amount of time it might take them. And um, there, we did that for the first few weeks. And it was convenient that my teaching overlapped with those first few practicals, because then I could add that in just at the beginning of my um, session. And as the module lead, I'd highlight, you have this practical this week, and these are the activities we've given you to support you on this. So you might want to engage with these. Um, and we, I found that they were much happier doing that after I'd taken them through it in class. Now, that's going to be harder if you've got fewer face-to-face -face sessions coming up next year, but a short Panopto video or something just to take them through and show them where things are um, will be helpful. Um, the students will engage best with these if they're associated with summative assessment. But we found that if you capture them early, they will happily engage with formative assessment for a period of time. It starts to drop off, but they're much more keen. And if you capture them and get them into a habit as they, when they first come, then they're more likely to engage. So we found that they will engage if it's not associated with a summative assessment, but that it is a slightly lower level of engagement. So then we've got a kind of some anecdotal notes. So we've talked about how the students felt. And I, I think, you know, from having run one or two of these practicals um, with the students, that when I compare them to previous cohorts, they were a lot more efficient. They were a lot more efficient in coming in and getting on. 
Um, and we all, so at Surrey, we have well, in the biochemistry group, we do um, pre practical lectures where we take them through what's expected, what should happen during the practicals, kind of data they might expect to see, the machinery. Um, and then we talk um, a, a very short intro at the beginning of the practical just to orientate them around the equipment, make sure they know what they're doing, and then they get on. And what I found was there's always been a lag phase. So the students sort of general milling a little bit at the beginning before they actually crack on with it. What we found was that the virtual lab software, the, the kind of impression I got was there was less of that milling around and kind of lag phase before they got in and got on with the practical. So that really helped, I felt. I also felt that they were better prepared in the majority. I mean, we always, you always have students that rock up and they don't even know what day it is or what practical they're doing. And we all have those experience experiences but um you know they were much better prepared for the practical in general and they were a lot more positive about the practical experience so there was less kind of general anxiety and worrying um, and i think that is kind of borne out by this um quote at the top sorry i seem to have skipped a slide just trying to minimize um, you all. So I think that the software definitely helped, especially with me and my lab partner. We both did it quite soon before the practical, which I think actually turned out as a positive because we then refer back to our memory. And I'm going to come on to how that links really with their learning cycle um, in a little while. But my last piece of kind of pragmatic advice is that as with everything, consistency is king. So, you know, it, we all have our own ways of doing things. We all have our own ways of delivering material. But when it comes to things like the LE structure, whether a practical has or you know, doesn't have something supporting it, then having some consistent delivery of those resources is really key. So for instance, you might have some uh, bought in um, labs that you might use from somewhere, or, and you might have some homemade videos or sort of um, bespoke videos that you've made in house that you will use for other um, practicals but as long as there's consistent structure to how the students are presented this information and there's a consistent approach so that perhaps each practical has something to support it then the students are much more likely to engage with it and what I find is that the minute you stop having something or the minute there's a difference then the students find it so much harder to engage with um, these, these things. So um, Moving into how sort of I'm using this to prepare for next year, one of the things I've been particularly concerned about is that, you know, we have a much more limited um, amount of wet lab space simply because we have to run so many more classes. So how can I most effectively use that time? And what I came up with was this three domain, what I came up with, what I came across was this three domain model, um, which really nicely encapsulates how students approach and learn um, various aspects of uh, practical um, information. And so it breaks down these three domains. We've got the cognitive domain, um, and the cognitive domain is the intellectual side. It's understanding the technique, understanding the underlying principles and science behind that technique, understanding the data that comes out of it and how to manipulate that data. So there's lots of different elements that fall into that cognitive domain. Then we have an effective domain, and these are the things which affect student performance, which you can't see or easily define. So that will be how they feel about the practical, the, um, the kind of, uh, level of background anxiety, confidence in asking questions or using equipment or just approaching the equipment. Because one of the things we find, you know, is that students looking across the spectrum may have had a practical when they arrive in October or September, they might have had a practical last in March or April, um, and they will have had a practical maybe in a room with 30 people, then now in a room with 200 people, 15 demonstrators and three members of staff, as well as technicians. So the, the, the sheer change of environment essentially almost means they've never seen anything like it before. Some people will adapt really quickly for that and they'll take it in their stride. Some others take an extra step. So that very much falls into the effective domain. It's affecting their performance, but it's not easily quantitative. It's not something you can see. 
There's also an element of um, accessibility here because in um, areas where you have perhaps a great portion of um, uh, ethnic minorities or you have a, a much more underprivileged um, area where we know that you know school budgets across different areas are massively different you see a difference in the amount of practical uh, experience that students have and so that can contribute to this area this uh, element as well because the the fact that the student may have had more or less practical experience in their previous education will mean they have a, a different approach to a learning cycle when it comes to developing practical skills. So then the final uh, example is the psychomotor domain and the psychomotor domain is the physical manipulation of the world around you. So it's everything from actually the tactile feel of a pet to using a spectrophotometer through to the proprioception of your you in the three-dimensional space that you have to do the work in. So, and there are a number of things that will change that. So that will involve differences in wearing a lab coat, wearing gloves or safety glasses, depending on what you're doing. And that will change those psychomotor elements. And we know, for instance, that, you know, you have certain skills which are fairly basic, um, and that might be the ability to undo the, the top of a cell culture bottle um, within the hood with one hand while you're also holding something else in the other hand. Or it might be through to a series of complex procedures in something like a titration, where you've got a number of manual handling and physical things you need to do in order to get the results from that experiment. Now, this kind of really spoke to me because it sort of linked really nicely into Danny's work. So Danny's work, if you think back to the um, self-efficacy element, the students really felt supported in developing those cognitive skills. So having an idea, a better, much more solid idea of how the equipment works, what the underlying principles of that equipment were, and how that equipment would then lead to the generation of data and results. And we also know from the, the uh, follow-up focus group work that there was a really strong element of the effective domain that was helped here, which it, it was in lessening the anxiety, in reducing the stress level, and enabling them to engage more with the whole experience. So those two, the cognitive and effective domains, are really well supported by the um, virtual laboratory experiences. The thing that we feel we therefore need to focus the majority of our lab time on is then the psychomotor skills, so the physical manual handling elements of learning lab skills, um, where we need to get the students to adapt to that environment and to think about the experiment in a three-dimensional physical sense. So um, we then will look to hone down um, the time they spend in the lab on simply developing the psychomotor side of things, with the cognitive and effective domain being more developed by um, extra activities and the virtual lab activities that we're going to employ. So this should mean that the students get just as good a development, hopefully maybe even a better development of those lab skills, um, before, uh, you know, without suffering. So they're educated, they're not losing out from a, um, a pedagogic point of view. So then um, I also started thinking about how the, the whole reflection process, and it's reflection something we all feel slightly strange about because everyone does it differently. But we all know that we engage when we're learning something with a reflective cycle. So for instance, we're introduced to a new concept and that concept will require some kind of evaluation or thinking about it. We'll reflect upon that and think about how that fits with what we already know. And then we were challenged on that. So it might be that we don't understand something or, you know, we've learned, we've changed something from our previous education before we can then adapt and, and take that forward and, and, and decide on what that really means to us. And having the virtual lab materials means that the students get to do this twice for every actual lab experience. So they're introduced in the first instance to the concept virtually, where they will go through the cycle um, before they come to the lab. 
the second time will then be in the lab and the experience will be different because you know the virtual lab activities we use are excellent and they are the students found them really easy to use but they are different from actually physically being present in the lab and so that means that much of the evaluation and the reflection process will lead to some challenging of the assumptions but whereas previously they were you know before we used the virtual lab equipment they were looking at what they knew maybe from a level or previous education which was a while ago they've now more recently been introduced to these concepts so it gives them a much more solid foothold into this reflective cycle which means that they can more effectively learn their learn the information so um just that leaves me to say thank you to obviously Danny um, and thank you to Naomi and John McVeigh who are her co-supervisors and I also want to thank the very much want to thank the um, biochemistry teaching team which is uh, Alfred Tunza, Sarah Bailey and Sarah Trinder um, and obviously the school for funding Danny's PhD. Um, so now if I stop sharing and um, open up to questions Nigel is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, both. Uh, we've had a lot of questions that come in. Um, first up, have you used learning science as a replacement for wet labs during COVID-19 lockdown or any plans to? Um, well, we haven't used them yet. So the students went home, um, so we didn't replace any labs with them. Um, that may not be true for everything. Um, there may have been some molecular biology labs, but I think they might have finished before they went home. Moving forward, we will replace some of the learning, but we, so what we're essentially doing is restructuring the lab activities so that we're not really replacing the psychomotor development part. They'll still learn the physical side of everything, but it will be supported virtually with things which will push them and challenge them using the learning science um, and VLE to do that. So that kind of partly answers David's question of how do you see this playing out as pre-lab on a dry workshop? Would it, for example, prompt the students to be able to ask more questions in face-to-face -face sessions? So I think uh, absolutely it would prep the students much better. So um, it's that confidence that they know what they're talking about, that they have some idea to base the questions on. Um, and so we very much found that the students were more likely to ask um, insightful questions rather than fundamental questions uh, they gave them a much more solid foothold in the topic yes um, i mean as um uh, we use phd student students as our lab demonstrators so when a student had used the software um admittedly obviously i have an intimate knowledge of the software and the the evaluations that were going on but it was very easy to pinpoint students who had really engaged with the software versus those who hadn't by the types of questions that they asked. So those who had used the software, which I'd then confirmed by saying, did you use the software, um, would tend to ask questions around either the theory or they might say, okay, well, this, this happened on the software is how does that sort of translate to here in the lab versus those who didn't tend to ask very much more fundamental questions much lower uh, lower level on the blue taxonomy so very much a what is this it, it was more identification so i mean it was uh, yeah um i hope that covers some of it yeah we see exactly the same thing at swansea so it's nice to know that it's panned out across lots of places um we've had another question which was what was the opinion of the uh, the teaching staff on the pre-lab software do they think it improves student experience or performance so rather than just your opinion as students, what do the other members of the teaching team think? So um, most of the other members of the uh, teaching team agreed that it um, definitely increased their confidence. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, nece that always follows through to performance, but they certainly approached the lab in a more positive light because they were more confident. And they, they were often or sometimes forced through a learning cycle much more quickly. Um, and they realized that actually they didn't necessarily understand what they had to do but it was a much quicker fix than it was if they'd come in with absolutely no idea um, so I, I would think most of the um, um, staff agree with me um, I don't know anybody that disagrees um, with that okay David's asked how long does the efficacy last are they still efficient in the same task weeks months after engaging with the pre-lab tasks 
Um, that is something I can't necessarily answer because I don't know we've looked at it. Um, I would say that there is definitely an, a, a skill attrition that's not uncommon. Um, so for instance, you'll teach them pipetting in week one and then in the middle of semester two, they, they pick up a pet and start using it like a club or something like that. So, you know, there's, there's always a level of skill attrition because they um, perhaps haven't practiced it um, or it requires the usual amount of um, reinforcement. But there's no, um, so th I don't see why they couldn't revisit those virtual experiences then to reinforce that. That's not something we've done, but it's something that could easily be done so that they're reinforcing those skills. One of the things that we did notice, we did look at um, how the students interacted with the VLE and particularly around the software. So how many clicks as it were through to the links that took them to the software that was embedded within our VLE. And they, whilst there were sort of peaks right before them with the labs, they did use them afterwards. And, and in the focus groups, it did come out that some of the students had revisited using them for uh, some elements whether that's representative of all the cohort, um, I wouldn't be able to say, but there was definitely a level where they do go back to this. Um, that that's for certain. Just as a follow up to that, have you seen? Have you looked at sort of gender bias in it at all? Because when we looked at it in Swansea, we saw a massive shift towards female students using this software over male students. I mean, and coming back to it repeatedly. So just wondering whether you'd looked at that at all. Um, I did have a quick look at the gender balance, yeah, because it was it was interesting. Now, the respondents to our surveys, there was a slight bias towards more uh, ladies responding than there were gentlemen, but um, in terms of the differences in, in use, it didn't find anything statistically significant at the time. Uh, whether that, that rolls through to other years, uh, you know, I have yet to analyse this year, so I think it would be something that I'd like to to target and look specifically whether the outcomes were different based on gender. Um, but I mean, it's certainly uh, something to look at. I think one of the thing, key things um, is often about attention span and uh, with the kind of digital or virtual experience, you know, a 15, 10 to 15 minutes is really the key window before you start trailing people. So the one thing about the, the, the resources we used was that they were nice, they were short, compact, uh, and they might have had several to do, but what we found is that they were maintaining um, and I don't think there was a particular difference in students doing, you know, in gender between that necessarily. Okay. I'd be really interested to talk to you about that at another time, so I won't monopolise this. But um, in terms of getting the right answer, do students get the right answer by just clicking or do they have to input answers? How many wrong attempts before the correct answer is revealed? Um, well, that's up to you. So the smart, the smart worksheets that we used, um, if we develop them, then... Um, we often had, a, if it was a summative one, they didn't get the right answer necessarily, um, or actually the, the kind of, the rule can be set that if they get given the answer because they haven't managed to work it out, then they don't get any marks for that or any subsequent calculations or you know, things like that. Um, so you can very much control that. Um, and you know what we found is that you'd give them two or three attempts to try and get the answer right, because any more than that becomes incredibly frustrating and they will just give up. Um, but actually what you find is that if you give them that, then they get the right answer. They're much more likely to engage with a reflection on the problem and go, oh, well, I can reverse calculate that to figure out how I got that wrong. Um, now, that's not true for everybody, obviously, but there is definitely the option for them to do that. So um, the formative ones were very highly taken up in the first year. Um, they were, but they then were followed with some summative smart worksheets, which is a bit of like carrot and stick. Um, in the second year, we took the stick away um, and we, because we wanted to develop writing skills a little bit more um, and that therefore we asked them questions at the end of the semester that were then linked to the assessment, the summative assessment, uh, the formative assessments rather. Um, but there was a slightly re reduced um, uptake and engagement, which is, uh, you know, something that everybody's found. If you don't attach a stick to it, they don't want to do it, or not everyone will do it. Yeah. Um, but is it compulsory to go through the pre-lab? So are the students allowed to join the practical if they haven't taken the online pre-lab activities? Um, they're not, not at Surrey. Um, and there's a kind of, 
there's a mixed there are mixed feelings about that because you could easily use um, that as a gateway activity so they can't do the lab unless they've done those activities so you could 100% do that um, and lots of VLEs will have conditional release so they have to do this in order to get the protocol or something like that um, there are all you know there are arguments however that there you know the same the argument is always they're adults if they choose not to do it that's up to them they won't get as much out of it at the end of the day and also there are some kind of accessibility issues where students may not have a computer at home they might have internet at home so they find it harder to engage um, and so it's the, the kind of adding that barrier to actually doing the lab might disadvantage some already disadvantaged students so you know there are different feelings on that we didn't do that so they didn't have to but you could easily use it as a as a tool to, as a barrier or gateway activity okay and uh, the last question we got is from david he said uh, given that we have limited lab time what do you consider the base psychomotor skills a student would need in the biosciences big question sorry so um i'll give you i'll tell you what our practicals were in our first semester the biochemistry module this year and what we're planning on doing next year um, so uh, last year they had um, a pipette practical where they were learning how to pipette accurately they had to use a balance they also had to measure um, spots of colored fluid on um, paper and plot a graph at the end of it so there are different skills associated with that um, they then had a spectrophotometry practical where they measured essentially food dye and they had to do a standard curve and dilutions. They had a, a protein assay, which is then slightly more complicated because there's a timing element um, and there's an actual application attached to that. Um, they have a stats practical, which is completely separate um, because it's online anyway. Um, and they have a titration. Now, to me, titration is something that has an awful lot of different psychomotor skills associated with it. Um, you have to manipulate an awful lot of different bits of equipment um, and understand that. So the plan going into next year is that much of the uh, kind of cognitive stuff will be taken out and we're literally going to be just getting them to use pipettes, use balances, all the kind of, and use spectrophotometers, having been given problems that lead to that practical so they will be there's much less kind of faffing in the practical which is valuable learning activity but takes away from the focus on those skills so just using the equipment um, and being familiar with the space this is of course coupled by the fact that they will have to work alone whereas ordinarily our students would work in pairs um, and therefore they will have to use all the equipment all the time. So they essentially can't get out of not using um, the bits and pieces of equipment we give them to offer. So um, we're having two practicals. We're, we're having one where they were doing um, essentially the base lab equipment with uh, pipettes, spectrophotometers, balances, um, making dilutions um, and doing concentration calculations. And the kind of intellectual side of that will be supported outside the lab with activities they have to do. Um, and then they, so that, what, that will be supported with virtual lab activities through learning science. And then we're keeping, but shortening the titration um, later in the semester. So whereas previously they would have done more multiple amino acid titration curves, um, they will do arginine um, because it's got multiple, um, uh, points so it's a bit more complicated and that will again be supported with virtual lab activities um, through learning science okay that's fantastic thank you very much for that uh, i'm sure if there are more questions that might come in the chat as we go on but if, just in the interest of time we switch tacks now but hopefully you guys will be around at the end if there are any more questions and we yeah, can... thank you thank you very much both